All right, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so next up, we have Jeffrey Landis talking to us. Um, Jeff works at NASA Glenn Research Center on uh, planetary exploration and technology for advanced space missions. And he's been looking at concepts for interstellar travel since the 80s, uh, including some work uh, on a NIAC study in 1998 on laser-propelled light sails. Uh, it also just so happens that uh, Jeff is a, an accomplished sci-fi author as well. So uh, thank you, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. So, oh, wow. hey, I got applause before I even say anything. Here we are, there's a whole universe out there. Well, interstellar flight, that is easy to do in science fiction. We see it all the time. It is, as it turns out, hard to do in the real world. Well, why is that? Well, here's a quote from Douglas Adams that explains it all. Space is big, it is really big. It is mind-bogglingly big. Okay, let's take a look at how big space is. Quick. Uh, here's the moon, half a million kilometers away, farthest we've ever been. Here's Mars, at its closest, it's roughly a uh, hundred times further away, a lot harder. Jupiter, 600 million kilometers away. Pluto, 6,000 million kilometers away. And of course, the other trans Neptunian objects. You want to go out to the Oort cloud, that's roughly seven million, million kilometers away. These are vast numbers compared to the places we've been, the moon. Go to the nearest star. We need 130 million, million kilometers. So roughly, it's about two million times further away from us than Mars. That makes it a hard problem. Uh, but the good news is there's a lot of stuff out there that we want to go visit. Uh, here's our interstellar neighborhood. We've been talking about uh, trips to Alpha Centauri, uh, but there's a lot of stuff out there in this uh, within about three parsecs uh, of the sun. There's a big neighborhood just in our tiny neighborhood uh, near the sun. Unfortunately, rockets just don't do it. You should know this already, but the amount of fuel you need is exponential in the velocity you need to go this 130 million, million kilometers. You need to go pretty fast. Uh, so for an exhaust velocity, you can get a tenth of 1% of C. Uh, you would need a mass of fuel 10 to the 86th times the mass of the spacecraft. That's not even within the realm of speculative fiction. Uh, well, people have proposed interesting things. Here's Freeman Dyson, 1968. Uh, proposed that the nuclear bomb-powered rocket he had been working on at the time said, well, what if we make a starship out of this? He said it could reach somewhere between 1,000 to 10,000 kilometers per second and make a trip to the nearest star uh, somewhere between 100 to 1,000 years. So here's that Orion spacecraft, at Dyson, and said, well, it will take 300,000 to maybe 30 million one megaton hydrogen bombs. Well, that's a lot of nuclear bombs. Uh, <laughs> this is not a easy problem. Uh, well, British Interplanetary Society picked us up and said, well, can't we do a little bit better than that? Uh, Alan Bond, who you may have heard of, he went on to work on, I think, the Skylon is his current project, uh, led this study, apparently done mostly in pubs uh, in Britain. <laughs> Uh, and said, well, if we could use micro-explosions, so it's like Orion, but teeny-weeny little bombs. Uh, bad news is it's a technology that doesn't exist, but he said we could do a mission, perhaps, to Barnard Star uh, in, on the order of 50 years. Uh, it's a very big object. Uh, the mission to Barnard Star is not something that we're going to do uh, pretty easily. It requires a pretty major space infrastructure. In fact, he was mining the atmosphere of Jupiter to fuel this uh, because once you're going to a nearest star, mining the atmosphere of Jupiter is comparatively easy. Uh, well, let's look at other options. Turns out Einstein told us that photons have momentum. Not a whole lot of momentum. 
the force is twice the power divided by the speed of light, and the speed of light is a big number. Uh, so that's not very much, but a sail pushed by the sun would use no fuel whatsoever. It's very efficient because it doesn't have that growth of propellant with delta V. I'm not going to talk much more about solar sails because you have somebody much more knowledgeable about, about solar sails. Les Johnson uh, will tell you a bit about it. Stay tuned. Uh, but their power efficiency, their fuel efficiency is magnificent. It's perfect. Uh, their power efficiency is terrible. Uh, there's 6.7 micronewtons per kilowatt, or I like to think of it as 6.7 newtons per gigawatt. Uh, that's a lot of power for a very little force. There's other possibilities. Here is something that was uh, proposed by Dana Andrews and Robert Zubrin back in 1988, two very clever people. They said, well, what if we use the solar wind instead? Now we can use magnetic fields to push the spacecraft. Well, how does that work? The solar wind is charged particles. Charged particles are deflected by magnetic fields. So therefore, you can push on a magnetic field. Well, the bad news is the solar wind has a lot less momentum de density in it than solar photon press. But the good news is the sail isn't that semiconductor hoop. The sail is actually the magnetic field. So the magnetic field can be huge for a relatively small uh, superconducting hoop. Well, interesting idea. A couple of other people have picked this idea up and run with it various directions. We talked about the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts, the predecessor of the current NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts program. Uh, Bob Wingley looked at the idea he called M2P2, mini magnetosphere plasma propulsion, that said, well, we can just make a plasma loop that does this. We don't even need the physical superconductor. Uh, here's another one also from University of Washington. This is the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. Said, well, we can make that plasma loop with rotating magnetic fields. So let's hold on to that thought of magnetic fields for a moment. Let's go back to uh, ordinary sails. We could push the sail. The problem, of course, with the sailing to the stars is that the sunlight goes away as one over r squared as you get far from the sun. But let's push it. We know how to make laser beams. There's other possibilities I'll talk about in a second. Microwave beams, particle beams, plasma beams. Uh, but let's look at laser beams. We could push the sail with a laser beam. Problem is, laser beams are not thin lines like in the picture. Over long distances, they diverge due to diffraction. Well, here's the solution. Since the beam divergence is inversely proportional to the aperture, we need a big aperture or a big lens or a big reflector. Well, Robert Forward is really sort of the grandfather of interstellar propulsion technique with laser pushed, and for that matter, microwave pushed uh, light sails. This is what he proposed back in 1984. He actually first proposed it, I think, in 1962 in a relatively obscure article talking about something else. Uh, but he actually worked out a lot of details in 84. He said, well, we will simply take a 10 to the 7th gigawatt laser uh, and a Fresnel lens that's 1,000 kilometers in diameter, and we can push on a sail all the way out to the nearest star. Well, turns out his 1,000 kilometer diameter lens is crazy, but it's not as crazy as you might think. Uh, because, in fact, it's a thin film lens that's half empty, so it's less than a micrometer thick. Still, it's a pretty big lens. Uh, here's a picture of it out. It would be positioned out by Saturn to give you the focal length that you need. Uh, so here's sort of a picture of that 1,000-kilometer sail being pushed uh, by a laser focused by this 1,000-kilometer lens, which you called a paralens. Uh, so beam pushed sails give you the possibility of moving without that exponential rocket equation because you're leaving the energy source on the ground or possibly in orbit. Uh, here's a bunch of Forward's uh, original concepts. What he said is, well, with a big enough lens, we can even send the power all the way out to his target. He picked Epsilon Eridani as a target. 
and we could even reflect it off another sail so that we could stop at the target star. Here is his uh, proposed two-stage light sail where the big sail over here, whoops, where's the, there's the laser, uh, is reflecting light onto the smaller sail that stops at the target star. I'm not going to discuss stopping at the target star. Uh, that would be another hour's worth of lecture, and I had enough problems pushing this three-hour lecture into 15 minutes. So we well, forward was looking at basically big missions. Uh, so one of the questions that we started looking at is how do you make smaller missions? How do you make something smaller? Well, the reason the lens is so big is that you're trying to push something over a tremendous distance. If you can push over a shorter distance, you could make smaller lenses. You could make everything smaller. To do that, you need higher acceleration. To maximize acceleration, you need to maximize the intensity of light on the sail. That turns out to be set by the temperature limit, which is set by the absorption of the sail, the emissivity of the sail, and how hot you can allow the sail to get. Uh, it turns out, after trying a bunch of different possibilities, the optimum sail turns out to be a thin refractory dielectric sheet, something like silicon nitride or silicon carbide, rather than the aluminum that was originally assumed. In fact, aluminum turned out to be almost the worst case because uh, it's not a very high temperature material. Uh, so there's been an evolution of thinking of laser pushed light sail concepts. Uh, forward in 85 proposed 65 gigawatts for the small probe. That was the smallest probe, 65 gigawatts. That went at 10% of light speed at uh, 0.036 G. Uh, in 95, I looked at niobium sails, uh, taking it to 107 gigawatts, uh, but you could get up to 0.82 Gs. Uh, looking at the dielectric sails, they turn out to be a lot better. Here was one at about 500 megawatts, pushed up to 43 Gs. Actually, the colleague of mine, the late Jordan Kerr, uh, picked up and that said, you know, why are you looking at so minor accelerations, why don't we put uh, 25 gigawatts onto a 26 centimeter sail uh, and we'll push it up at 10 million Gs. Uh, and he said, well, they're tiny sails, but we will then bash those sails into something else. And he picked a, a mag sail where the sails were pushing vaporize at the mag sail and push it on. These led actually to this thought. You may have heard of this one, the breakthrough starship concept. Starshot, uh, 200 gigawatts, now pushing uh, 15,000 Gs to take a 5-gram probe to 20% uh, of light speed. Uh, Some more concept. Here's just sort of the graphic of Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, one thing we know is it probably will not look like this. Uh, that was an old sort of analysis. And the laser array probably won't look like that either. Uh, but this gives, does give you the idea that we're doing square kilometer area arrays in order to get that diffraction down in order to push a relatively small sail to a high speed. Well, there are other possibilities. There's another one that Freeman Dyson and Robert Forward sort of co-invented, the idea, well, instead push with microwaves. The idea of microwaves originally was uh, since microwaves have a relatively long wavelength, you can make a sail that's mostly open area. Uh, so you can just make a mesh and it might be very light. And he proposed that a uh, solar sail like this you might be able to make at 115 Gs. Uh, the problem with microwaves is because the wavelength uh, is orders of magnitude larger, the lens gets bigger. So here's a lens that's 50 thousand kilometers in diameter, the lens is now about the size of Saturn. Uh, unfortunately, forward in 85 didn't look at the thermal limits. Turns out there's some pretty bad thermal limits uh, because you do absorb some of the energy. He was again using uh, aluminum, which, oops, sorry, which would put you uh, you know, way down at very low accelerations. But if you sort of go up to something that can take higher uh, intensity of microwaves, you can go out pretty high. And in fact, you can buy thin graphite sheets. 
uh, in fact, foam, foamed graphite sheets. Here's a, I think uh, Jim Benford's in the audience here. Here's some uh, working uh, partly in collaboration with me and then further on with some NASA funding, uh, looking at pushing microwaves on carbon fibers uh, and actually demonstrating carbon fiber is sort of the ultimate in high temperature material. It doesn't melt, it sublimes. Uh, we know that here's a mission uh, launching this summer and it's using that high temperature capability to drop in close to the sun, about eight solar radii from the surface of the sun and the spacecraft hides behind a graphite shield that allows it to get close to the sun. Well, uh, what Jim and Greg Benford uh, worked on is they did a beam riding carbon sail and actually demonstrated uh, that you could launch uh, a sail. I'm not showing the video. Uh, either come by or see Jim. You can probably see some of the videos. These are pretty impressive. Uh, not only does it move out pretty fast, uh, but it lights up as it goes and, in fact, desorbs a lot of gas. Well, there's some other possibilities. I talked about magnetic sails before, but you could also use a beam-driven magnetic sail. It just means push on the sail with a focused particle beam. Why a particle beam? Good news, particle beams don't diffract, so you don't need the giant lens. Bad news is they diverge for other reasons, uh, particularly thermal blooming, inhomogeneities, electrical magnetic interactions. Uh, particle beams over very long distances do not want to stay pencil beams. There's actually a NIAC uh, proposal that just got awarded that's trying to look at solving that. Uh, but right now, particle beams have some questions that need to be answered first. Uh, one last possibility, what I mentioned is that these sails have terrible power efficiency. One way to improve the power efficiency is say, well, let us use that power and put it into something that is more efficient, like an ion engine. There's a lot of work going on making solar cells thinner and thinner. And uh, if they get thin enough, we might be able to make sort of a hybrid something that's not really a sail, but is lighter than a conventional solar array uh, that can push a high performance electric engine, perhaps an ion engine, uh, that can give you better fuel efficiency than chemical rockets, not the ultimate fuel efficiency of a laser push sail, but give you some of the advantages of both. Uh, so with that, I actually went through all 42 slides in 15 minutes. I'm out of time but I will answer questions. So thank you. Okay, Jeff, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, where are you, right sir? Right back here. Ah. Excellent job. Uh, thank you. Two, uh, two comments, <clears throat> more than questions. One, uh, many people might be aware that when people started noticing the strange light curve to Kepler 814, mm -hmm. 562, mm -hmm. Boyne-Hans star, mm -hmm. the possibility was raised. We were looking at a very large structure, actually, mm -hmm. to send microwaves converted from, sun, from starlight onto, onto starships. Another possibility is, in a lot of my work, I've gone back to Les Shepard's concept of the thousand-year arc. Mm -hmm. Do you think it makes sense to get away from interstellar travel by probes or people within a human lifetime and go back to this concept to make it a little more sensible in terms mm -hmm. of technology. I have become much more optimistic about probes in the last few years uh, with partly the breakthrough Starshot uh, suddenly focusing a lot of attention on probes. Uh, humans are a hard project. I am very optimistic about humans going into space, uh, but I admit that it may require re-engineering the humans. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if I were going the very long distance, probably a beam-pushed sail uh, is probably not the way to do it, but that's still open. I like antimatter concepts if you can make yeah. antimatter work. Obviously, new physics would be nice. Uh, so I'm optimistic in the long term, uh, but it's a very hard problem. Thank you. So, okay. It's good. Uh, Here we go. Uh, I wasn't sure where to drop this in, and your talk gave it the perfect opportunity. 
Um, great, great as always, Jeff. Um, the, I just wanted to point out, one of the things that Breakthrough Starshot has mm -hmm. really helped with is it's getting people thinking again about what you can do with the very smallest active payloads. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it, but I wanted to highlight that I think that really calls for a serious re-examination of the sail beam class of concepts. Because now with those same electronics breakthroughs let us do self-steering, mm -hmm. essentially, pellets, mm -hmm. which gives you the divergence-free beam that we all wanted to have mm -hmm. for beam propulsion. I just thought your talk gave the perfect chance to make that <laughs> note. Yeah, there's other types of beam propulsion that I sort of vaguely alluded to but didn't get to. Uh, one of them is the pellet beam. So you actually, instead of having a particle beam, you have more macroscopic pellets. Uh, Jordan worked on that with the idea that the pellets, in fact, are tiny little solar sails or tiny little laser push sails. There's a lot of interesting things uh, that you might be able to to work out, and that has not been worked out in great detail. Uh, Jerry Nordley has been working a lot on the macroscopic beam pushed sail, uh, originally invented by Singer, I think. One more back here. Um, hi, uh, this is a, a, a question from a non-specialist. Um, uh, when you mentioned, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm considering the case where the payloads are significant. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned the possibility of putting the laser drive in space. And that got me a bit worried about uh, the recoil on the mm -hmm. laser drive. And then when you're talking significant payloads and very high speeds, even if the lasers are on the Earth, is the recoil uh, a significant factor and something one needs to worry about? Yeah, the recoil, of course, is uh, about three, a little bit under four newtons per gigawatt. So. Uh, Newton's a little bit over a pound. So you're talking about a recoil of a, a couple of pounds on these, typically these missions. Uh, it's relatively easy to deal with. Uh, uh, we've actually looked at this question, uh, but it turns out it's so easy to deal with. There's so many things that you can do to deal with that. Basically, your beamer is so much heavier than your spacecraft that it doesn't move very much. Uh, whatever your power source for the beamer is, it probably has waste heat. And if you just reject the waste heat in the opposite direction from your photon beam, it would be uh, compensated at an efficiency of about 50%, which is about what we can expect. But it's dealing with the recoil is, turns out not to be much of a problem. Okay. That's a lot. That was great.